Um, so, what we have here, this is um, the background recording for um, Monster Peterport 1am, of uh, the sounds of um, the marina, very, very early in the morning. There's some extra little noises for some reason, to kill that as well. So that is the sound of me sat on a pontoon at one o'clock in the morning, just with that in front of me. And you can listen to it for eight minutes and hear drunk people go past and boats moving in and out and the tide moving around the marina and the creaking and the groaning of the pontoons. And most people that have been in uh, St Peter Port recognise the sound straight away, I would, I would guess. So how do you decide to put the, the overlay on after you've got the sound? On most of the pieces I actually did write some of the music first and then after I did the location recording I then bent what I'd already done around the, um, the recording of the sound of Guernsey. Um, pure, I think that's an interesting way to do it, so it's, it's a more unexpected way of, of kind of having the background sound reveal itself in places that you wouldn't expect. I mean the seagulls there, I don't even know if you, you can hear those in the finished piece or not. So, no, you might hear it there, but the music ebbs and flows, so... Um, this has been performed live um, by some string players and piano player in St James, and um, so I've written a live score for it. And the instructions are that the background sound plays on a loop before the piece starts, so nobody knows where um, the background comes in and out so it would be different every time it's performed. So, and that, that goes back to revealing different aspects of the, the found sound recording. So once again, that's where we are in the background. The music over it is like that, so. so. But yeah, as for the process, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> It's a mystery. <laughs> so how did you decide to, to actually go to First Bay and say, you know, I record the sounds and then did you think about, you know, see what I get and then see if I can work with it as a music piece or? Well, this, this was the first one I did with a background sound recording, but I'd already written a piece based on um, Bordeaux before this. Um, the whole project, um, Seven Nocturnes East, um, there was never one idea I had at one time. It, it's very much developed. Um, partly as a result of um, the exhibition being on offer and partly just as I got more and more into the concept. So, um, so yeah, this is the first one I did. It seemed to work really well. People seemed to find it quite interesting. So, um, so I carried on, basically, and have tried to make each place very different. Um, the main concept is, as you can see, that that is the recording and I haven't edited it at all. I haven't tried to make it perfect, I haven't tried to find out oh, that's a really interesting bit where you can hear a car or try to remove the sound of cars and motorbikes. It's, it's just there, it's an authentic recording and each of the places I've been to I've done the same thing. I've, I've rocked up, hit record on this for 10 minutes and that's it and I haven't tried, I haven't gone back at any time, I haven't tried to find the perfect recording. So hence we've ended up with the sound of diggers at four o'clock in the morning, sound of burger alarms in various places, recorded in a storm, went down to Belgrave Bay, down to the, um, the sea, expecting to record just gentle waves lapping on the beach, and instead I got caught in a thunderstorm. Um, and, and so it goes on, really. So how do you feel um, about having a visual artist not only responding to your music, but going to the bay and having their own experiences in and the space. I think it's really interesting and I think it's slightly overwhelming that um, so many people have kind of run with, not necessarily my idea, but a similar idea. Everybody seems to have taken it um, to some very interesting places. So, uh, yeah, I'm really looking for, I, I've seen obviously some parts of what people have done already, but I haven't, I'm really looking forward to the finished exhibition see what it's all like when it comes together. So uh, so yeah, so this is the found sound from Mont Crevel at four o'clock in the morning. Um, it was a really incredibly still night when, when I woke up, I didn't stay up till four. And um, it was a low spring tide, pretty much exactly at four o'clock in the morning and truly expected to record absolutely nothing. Like, 
and um, which would have tested the project, I guess, to its limit. Uh, when we got there, we found there was two massive diggers working in um, St. Sampson's harbour mouth. So we got loads of drones and records of diesel engines and, and workmen shouting at each other across the harbour mouth. And um, and towards the end of the piece, piece sorry, I've got my uh, words coming out correctly, uh, there's two diggers coming up the slipway that make the most unbelievable racket. So. How did you decide to do 1am, 2am, 3am? At one stage I think, uh, as the, the idea of the project developed, I think at one stage it was going to be almost like a, walk, a late night walk. Uh, that, that, was, um, that was one idea. Um, but it kind of took on a life of its own and it, it's taken longer to come together than I, than I expected for various reasons. So, um, so yeah. but. I used to live. I've since moved, but I used to live in this area, so it was very much it was very much part of my walk home to Peterport, Belgrave Bay, um, not quite Spur Point, but um, it's also the area I grew up in, so I know it quite well. And there's also a slight feeling that, other than St Peterport, they're all quite either overlooked places or abandoned places or places that people don't tend to go to in Guernsey. Um, and Moncravel fulfills that. It's an old fort, um, and now surrounded by industrial detritus. And it looks like in a few years' time, it, it, it's, I mean, it's abandoned now. And if there's a massive crack in the in the loophole tower, which I don't know if it's ever going to be repaired or not. So, who knows what it will look like in ten years' time? I think. Yes, yeah, that's very much, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, okay, it's become apparent in looking it up just now, this one's split between my laptop and um, my, my computer in here, so, um, yeah. It would take a bit more effort to get the real thing back. But um, there's a bit of minimal... Um, if we call that up... Uh, where are we? All good fun. Yeah. So we've got a couple of um, couple of marimba noises. Of, um, it's meant to um, simulate some minimal music of um, tape loops. There's two marimbas playing exactly the same pattern, but one of them is very slightly out of sync. So eventually the notes drift away from the original. Uh, so this explains part of the. Um, the joy, if you like, of using um, virtual instruments. This is um, an amazing thing called Lord of the Springs, which has got the best name for an instrument I've ever heard. And it's based on um, an artificial manipulation of one virtual string. And you you can do all sorts of weird tunings with it. So that's playing the exact melody that's in the piece, but brings out different harmonics and completely different feel of what it can be. So if I'd had the the harmonics set there, the piece would sound completely different. I've also done some weird things with micro tuning with it. The gaps between the notes, the white and the black keys, is quite weird. Um, it's the first time I've ever experimented with anything like that. But um, but nobody's mentioned it as being unusual, so um, it, it just it just seems to work. So. Can't remember where they were. Now. <laughs> 